It would be a parent's worst nightmare. Just a normal day out at the mall or on a hike, even in the backyard of your home with your child. One minute the sound of laughter and playing is around, and then an eerie silence. And this time, it lasts forever. Here are five shocking stories from missing children. Number five, the disappearance of William Terrell. On September 12th of 2014, three-year-old William Terrell, his foster parents, and his five-year-old sister had traveled from Sydney, Australia to visit his foster grandmother's home on Benaroon Drive in Kendall. It was a long drive north, about four hours, well worth it to get out of the city and into the beautiful town that was nestled against the backdrop of the expansive Kendall State Forest. When they arrived, the children hugged their grandmother, but the kids were also anxious to get out there and play. So they started off around 9 a.m. riding bikes in the driveway, followed by a game of hide-and-seek in the yard, which went on for about a half hour while the grown-ups watched from the porch. Williams's mom went inside to make a spot of tea, and by the time she came out, panic set in. As she began a frantic search, soon joined by his father, who had just returned from an errand, because Williams was nowhere to be found. After 30 minutes with no luck, 10.57 a.m., she made a desperate call to triple zero. By 11.06 a.m., the New South Wales police force was on the scene. When played out like many missing children cases, parents couldn't believe what they were describing, having to tell them that their boy had light brown hair wearing his Spider-Man costume, which he loved. There was an immediate search, of course, that yielded nothing, and so more police were brought in along with canines. And initially, investigators focused on the possibility of an abduction, because the scent of William, detected by those police dogs, was confined to the yard, leading to theories that he had been taken quickly and efficiently. Now, had he wandered off and gotten lost, well... The dogs would have followed, but they didn't. Regardless, an exhaustive search ensued to make sure, involving hundreds of volunteers, helicopters, and specialized police units. But still, Williams' whereabouts remained unknown. Eventually, suspicion then began to fall on two vehicles seen near the house on that morning. White station wagon and an older-style gray sedan. Now, these were seen by Williams' mum, parked on the road between two driveways across the street. In a neighborhood like this one, everyone was friendly enough, and yet no one knew who these cars belonged to. No one there owned them. No friends or relatives were visiting who drove these, so what were they doing there, and who was behind the wheel? And following this lead, a neighbor said that around 9 a.m., they saw a green or gray sedan drive down Benaroon Drive, right past where William and his sister were riding bikes, before it reached a dead end, pulled a U-turn, and drove away. As it turns out, that area around Kendall housed numerous registered offenders who may have been interested in William. Despite these suspicions, no concrete evidence linked any of them to his disappearance, but it does seem like someone may have been watching and taking the boy at an opportune time. Two years after the boy vanished, the New South Wales government offered a $1 million reward for any information leading to his recovery. This unprecedented move underscored the desperation and determination to find him. Yet, hope began to wane as years passed without a breakthrough. And over the years, this case has received a record number more than 3,000 calls to Crime Stoppers, with more than 1,000 people being interviewed about possible sightings and leads. And all of this eventually pushed authorities towards another angle, and in 2021, new evidence prompted them to renew their search, this time with the grim expectation of finding Williams' remains. And the focus shifted towards the possibility of a tragic accident occurring, on November 15, 2021, police began investigating whether William had fallen from the balcony of his foster grandmother's house. The foster mother, now deceased grandmother, became persons of interest, further complicating an already convoluted case. 
In a dramatic turn of events, police recommended charges against Williams' foster mother in June of 2023 for perverting the course of justice and interfering with a corpse. This revelation suggested a potential cover-up of an accidental death, shattering all the previous assumptions about bad people in the neighborhood. It would also explain why his scent never made it outside the confines of that yard. But right now, that's currently the status in this case. They ramp up their evidence to try and prove it. But with so much time having gone by, so many twists and turns in this case, whether or not anything will come of this remains to be seen. Number four, a mystery on the Greek island of Kos. On July 24th, 1991, 21-month-old Ben Needham was left in the care of his grandparents, Eddie and Christine Needham, as his mother Kerry was working nearby at a local hotel. The family was living in the beautiful village of Arachlis on the island of Kos, where they were renovating an old farmhouse on the property. Ben had been playing in and around the area until 2.30 p.m. when his grandparents realized he was no longer anywhere in sight. The panic set in as they searched all around, initially believing Ben had wandered off or hoping he was with his teenage uncle, Stephen, on a moped ride. But when ultimately there was no trace of Ben, the authorities were alerted, marking the beginning of a relentless search. The initial efforts were intense and had personnel from the Hellenic Police, Army, and Fire Brigade scouring the entire island for 11 days, and yet not a single trace of the boy. The Chief of Police, Nicholas Decorus, expressed the perplexity that has since shrouded the case, stating, We have no theories, we have no solutions. Ben was there one minute, then just gone the next. Since then, especially early on before the case went cold, more than 300 sightings of boys matching Ben's description have been reported all across Greece. Each lead raised hopes for a moment, only to be dashed by subsequent investigations. For example, the discovery of a blonde boy in a Romani camp in Salonika in 1995, who was later confirmed not to be Ben, and a sighting on a beach in Rhodes in 1998 also led to a dead end after DNA testing. In October of 2012, South Yorkshire police in England, who were involved because Ben was an English citizen, pursued a grim line of inquiry suggesting that the child might have been accidentally killed and buried in a mound of rubble by an excavator driver working near the farmhouse. Now it could have been a total accident without anyone realizing it happened or Maybe the boy was accidentally killed and then intentionally buried. This theory led to extensive excavations by British and Greek police who pulled out all the stops, conducting geological surveys, bringing in human remains detection dogs, but the search yielded no human remains or conclusive evidence. The police, though, were returned to coast in September of 2016 for further excavations. This time they recovered a yellow toy car that belonged to Ben. Detective Inspector John Cousins, leading the inquiry, stated his professional belief that Ben died in an accident near that farmhouse. Although no human remains were found, the recovery of the toy car and its location supported the theory that Ben's death was accidental and his body might have been moved along with building rubble. The Needham family has long believed that Ben might have been kidnapped, either to be sold for adoption or taken by child traffickers, though this may sadly be a case of not wanting to admit that the boy passed away during construction. Better he be alive out there somewhere, even if the circumstances are dire. There is no evidence to support this, but if this were the case, to aid in the search, age progression images of Ben were created and distributed at various intervals starting from September of 1992, shortly after his disappearance, to the latest in September of 2016. Number 3. The Vanishing of Kristen Madaffery 18-year-old Kristen Madaffery had just completed her freshman year at North Carolina State University 
on a prestigious Park Scholarship with future plans to pursue a career in photography. Seeking to see life on the West Coast and what it had to offer, she then decided to spend her summer in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she enrolled in photography classes at the University of California, Berkeley. In early June of 1997, Kristen then relocated to Oakland, finding a room through Craigslist in a house on Jane Avenue. She shared that home with four male roommates and secured some work at the San Fran Museum of Modern Art, as well as Spinelli's Coffee Shop and the Crocker Galleria Mall. Life seemed promising as she settled into her new environment, but all of her dreams would soon abruptly come to a halt. On June 23rd at around 3 p.m., after finishing her shift at the coffee shop, Kristen told her co-workers about her plans to visit Baker Beach for a party. Approximately 45 minutes later, though, she was seen by some co-workers on the second floor of the mall with an unidentified blonde woman. This mysterious female has never been identified or come forward, but it's believed in some way, shape, or form he is involved in this case, because shortly after that, surveillance footage captured Kristen withdrawing cash from an ATM in the mall, marking the last known sighting of her. The following day, Kristen failed to attend her first photography class, one which she spent almost $1,000 to be a part of. Her roommates hadn't seen her either, and she never returned to the apartment after her shift on June 23rd. However, they didn't report her absence because, well, they hadn't known her all that long and assumed she was simply out and about. It wasn't until her dad left a voicemail on the house's landline that one of the roommates informed him that no one had seen Kristen for three days. Upon learning of their daughter's disappearance, her parents flew out there where they reported her missing to the Oakland PD on June 27th. Unfortunately, law enforcement initially classified Kristen as a runaway, delaying the investigation until June 30th. In the meantime, her parents hired a private investigator and offered a $50,000 reward for any information just to help kickstart and get people moving. When police finally got to work some seven days after she was gone, bloodhounds traced Kristen sent to a bus stop outside the mall, and her trail was detected near Sutro Heights Park, some 30 minutes on the other side of town and in the opposite direction of where she lived. But there, it vanished. During the search of Kristen's room, a local newspaper was found with a personal ad circled. It was an odd one that was seeking female friends to share activities with. And the individual who placed the ad was never located, there was no indication Kristen responded to it. However, could this possibly be the unidentified blonde woman, and did she have sinister intentions? And had it been her who wanted to bring Kristen to Baker Beach for a party that day? Around 10 days later, a man named John Onuma called a local news station claiming Kristen had been murdered by two women and her body disposed of under a wooden bridge near Point Reyes. Onuma, a resident near the Galleria, later admitted to fabricating the story out of spite towards the women he accused believing they were trying to get his girlfriend fired. While Onuma denied ever meeting Kristen, interestingly, he had a history of placing personal ads in the paper to lure women and coerce them into sex. This case ultimately went cold from there, but in 2015, an independent search of the house where Kristen had been living revealed something rather startling. A cadaver dog alerted to the presence of human remains in the basement. And further investigations by forensic anthropologist Dr. Arpad Vass pinpointed areas of interest, including a concrete slab at the base of the porch steps, where a chemical signature indicating human blood was found. And DNA testing match the decomposing material to Kristen's parents, suggesting the possibility of foul play out there. Despite these compelling findings, the open PD hesitated to act. They claim that Dr. Vass has never given them the results of his findings to which the doctor claims is untrue. And even if he didn't, all the SFPD needs to do is take a look themselves with their own canines and see what happens. As of today, 
That entire angle has not been investigated further. Number two, Jared Atadero in the Colorado Mountains. Jared Atadero was a lively and curious three-year-old boy living with his family in the wonderful state of Colorado. He had an older sister, Jocelyn, who was six. Sadly, his parents, Alan and Stacy, got divorced, and Alan had to navigate being a single father with full custody of the young ones. Alan was a phys ed teacher at the local middle school and found solace and support through the Christian community and the Christian Singles Network, which provided him and the kids some sense of stability. And so, the Atadero's were heavily integrated into the group's activities, often participating in community events and excursions whenever they could. On October 2nd of 1999, Alan, along with his kids, were staying at the Poudre River Resort. Nice little picturesque hotel that was actually owned by Alan and his twin brother Arlen. Christian Singles Group had planned a visit to a nearby fish hatchery, a trip that Jared and Jocelyn were excited about. Alan couldn't make it due to work obligations, and despite initial hesitations, since these people were essentially his extended family at this point, well, he allowed the kids to go. After all, it was just a simple outing there and back. But, you know, the weather was just so nice that day. Perfect, crisp fall air in the mountains. And so the group decided to do a hike up the Big South Trail in the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest. As the hike progressed, the group then split into faster and slower factions. Jared, with his boundless energy, ran ahead and was last seen by two fishermen who he quickly talked to. Now, he could see the group no more than 50 feet down the trail, so he knew he was with them, so nothing was out of the ordinary. Jared then walked up the trail towards them, and that was the last confirmed sighting of the boy. In Jared's absence became apparent the group searched for a solid hour before returning to the resort to inform Alan. The news shattered the man, he was overwhelmed with grief and fear, repeating in anguish, They lost my baby. The Larimer County Sheriff's Office quickly deployed a search and rescue team with Bill Nelson, the undersheriff leading the search, who believed they would find Jared swiftly. However, as hours turned into days, the search faced numerous challenges, including a tragic helicopter crash that injured several team members and added to the chaos of the whole situation. The disappearance of Jared quickly attracted media attention, reminiscent of the high-profile John Bonet Ramsey case. TV crews and reporters swarmed the search area, adding pressure to an already tense situation. Everything was compounded by the media's relentless coverage and the involvement of people claiming to be psychics and self-proclaimed experts. Despite extensive efforts, eventually it all died down, leaving the Adadero family in a painful limbo. And then nearly four years later, on May 6th of 2003, hikers Rob Osborne and Gareth Watts made a haunting discovery in the Poudre Canyon area near Big South Trail. They found partial human remains, including a brown fleece sweater, blue trousers, and Disney Tarzan sneakers, items that Jared had been wearing when he disappeared. The remains, which went through DNA testing, confirmed they belonged to Jared and Alan, instead of burying or cremating the remains, chose to keep them as part of a shrine in Jared's old bedroom, preserving his memory and finding solace in his faith. As to what happened, well, nobody's 100% sure, but two theories prevail. The first is that the boy fell victim to a mountain lion attack. However, inconsistencies in this theory arise from the condition of Jared's clothing and remains. Experts noted that a mountain lion would typically attack the stomach area first, yet Jared's sweater showed no such damage. His trousers were found inside out, and his sneakers were relatively intact, contradicting the expected signs of an animal dragging its prey. The other theory suggests that Jared was abducted and murdered by an unknown individual. This theory gained some traction from the condition of Jared's trousers, which appeared to be turned inside out by human hands, rather than animal activity. 
However, no concrete evidence or suspects emerge from the investigation, leaving this theory speculative. But to this day, the case of Jared Atadero remains an unsolved mystery, a cold case that continues to haunt the Colorado mountains. Number one, the final trip. On Wednesday, May 11, 2011, six-year-old Timothy Pitson was dropped off at Greenman Elementary School in Aurora, Illinois by his father, James. However, within just minutes, his mother, Amy, arrived and checked him out of school, citing a family emergency that, unbeknownst to anyone, will be caused directly by Amy herself. Now, her first stop would be an auto body repair shop where she dropped off her car. An employee from there then drove Amy and her son over to the Brookfield Zoo to spend the day. After retrieving their vehicle, they then spent the night at the Key Lime Cove Resort in Gurney, Illinois. And James was worried sick as he hadn't heard from his wife or child, and so he alerted the authorities. They wouldn't find this out till later, but the following day, the mother and son traveled to Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin, which is about 185 miles north of Aurora. Surveillance footage from a motel showed them checking in, and the following day, on the 13th, checking out. Amy then made several calls to her family members, assuring them that she and Timothy were safe. These calls were traced to an area northwest of Sterling, Illinois, which brought the duo back down south, again closer to Aurora, but still an hour west. During the calls, Timothy was heard in the background saying that he was hungry. Despite these reassurances, Amy did not contact her husband, who was frantically searching for them at this point. And from then on, what happened to Timothy is unknown, but later that evening, Amy was seen alone on surveillance at the family dollar store in Winnebago, Illinois, purchasing some stationery. She was then spotted at a Sullivan's food store, again unaccompanied, at 11.15 p.m., and she checked in to the Rockford Inn in Rockford, Illinois. The next morning, on May 14th, her lifeless body was discovered by a hotel maid in that bathtub. Amy had decided it was time to leave this earthly plane. In the note she left on that stationery, she claimed that Timothy was with people who would care for him and that he would never be found. The knife they discovered in the motel contained only her blood. Amy's cell phone was missing and her car was found to have been parked in a grassy area near a stream, close to a highway out back. Two years later, her cell phone was actually found along Route 78, but yielded no new clues. The lack of concrete evidence left investigators and Timothy's family grasping for answers, so where did Timothy go? On April 3rd of 2019, hopes were momentarily lifted when a teenager in Newport, Kentucky, claimed to be Timothy Pitson, Local residents called the police after seeing the distraught young man who said he had escaped from his captors. The next day, the FBI revealed that the boy was not Timothy, but a 23-year-old man named Brian Reaney. Reaney, who had a history of mental illness, had recently been released from prison, and he was later sentenced two more years behind bars for the hoax. James remains hopeful that his son is alive and out there somewhere. They like to believe that Amy stayed true to her word in that note, though nobody knows for sure. Despite extensive searches and numerous investigations, that Timothy's whereabouts remain unknown. So there were five shocking stories of missing children. Thanks for tuning in. If you want more content like this, remember to subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we're posting our new content three new episodes every single week. Thanks so much for stopping by today. I'll see you guys soon.